I've always hated being dragged to my parents' dinner parties. I mean, don't all kids? The men in one room, drinking whiskey and arguing about stocks, and the women in the other, gossiping and discussing their children. The same rice and dal and paneer tikka masala as every other day, and every Indian kid there just begging for some mac and cheese, but the wish is never granted. <laughs> and as I grew older, oftentimes the kids were out of the house either at rehearsals or just non-existent to begin with. And so I'd sit with the men. Their conversations were interesting. Finance and cars and TV shows. Silicon Valley, a show their teenage son loves, but is far too risque for an innocent young woman like me. Because a guy can handle sexual jokes, but a girl the same age can't, right? Oftentimes, their conversations would turn to politics. And this is the point where I'd sit a little taller, lean in, and put away whatever potato chips I'd been monotonously eating the entire time. Because politics was my thing. Ever since I was a little girl, I'd run around telling people that I was going to be the first woman president of the United States. Sure, I thought I could paint the White House pink, and that Hillary Clinton was both a huge inspiration and a massive threat. But I seriously developed a passion for current events and politics and the way the government works. I had opinions and strong ones. I asserted them so myself and them wherever I saw fit, because that's what I was taught. Differing opinions means discussion, and discussion means change, and change is progress. That's what we're going for, right? These are the values that I felt I should reflect. My dad and I used to mock debate in the car. We still do. He says something to incite me, and everyone passing us on the highway just sees a really angry Indian girl in the front seat going off about tax reform or God knows what. But it developed my argumentative skills, and he taught me to be a strong woman when I do go into politics one day. With this in mind, I was in an, at another one of these dinner parties about two years ago. And though I dropped the idea of being president in about fourth grade, because I realized, you know, no pink White House, it's not really worth it. Um, I still retained my passion for political debate. And I'm sitting there judging these people's taste and decor when this Indian uncle brings up, get this, Trump immigration policy. Yeah, I was really excited to get into that conversation. It was perfectly in my wheelhouse. And I asserted myself, I disagreed, and I did it respectfully, whether that Respect was, in turn, given back to me, is still up for debate. As we got into the conversation, I noticed his facial expressions cast me off. Who is this? A five foot three Indian girl who writes essays about the Trump wall plan in her free time? He thought that he was gonna plow over me, prove himself right, and maintain the respect of all the other men in the room. But I'm sorry, uncle, I have some bad news for you. I am a five foot three Indian girl who writes essays about the Trump wall plan in her free time. He ended up conceding a lot of his points. And I conceded a few of mine too, that's how debates work. But I was proud because it substantiated what I'd worked so hard for. It proved that I could beat him, even if he was a man and I was a girl. He had underestimated me and he recognized it. First, he praised me for my well-spokenness, for how I was able to match his level of conversation. <sighs> then, though, he laughed, bitterly. And I realized his ego was damaged. And I realized I come from a community deeply entrenched in misogyny. Because the next words out of his mouth were, God help her husband. And everybody laughed. Because my value is based on what a man thinks of me. My value is based on whether or not I get married at the right age, and whether I get children out of that marriage, and whether I take care of those children like a good Indian woman does. Because in Indian society, marriage has been an integral institution for thousands of years. For centuries, marriage has been the prison of millions of Indian women. And of course, marriage for me will not be like that. My family is not that conservative. And I'm grateful for that. But 
they come off as more progressive as they actually are because we cannot escape these values. I see it. They judge the cousins who marry late and they judge the women who never marry. So I was told these things not outright, but I found them out. And after all that time, the comment was something that I had gotten millions of times before. God help her husband. Good luck finding someone who's going to marry a girl like that, who's loud, not worthy of love, not a proper woman. But that day it hit differently. After years and years of being put down, degraded for doing the things that I loved so much, I began to internalize this. The thought that my value is based on a man, what a man thinks of me, how gentle and quiet and meek I am. And that wasn't the only thing that I internalized over the years. Though this may be more specific to the South Asian community, one thing I internalized is something that almost every woman in this room is guilty of, which is internalizing and catering to the male gaze. The idea that the world is seen through a man's eyes, and to be good, you must validate yourself as a man would validate you, which is what makes me want to shave my legs, what makes me only go out if I feel like a man would approve of what I'm wearing, of how I look. And it's not that I dress for the men. It's not that I put on my clothes and I go, oh, I hope the boys think I look good today. It's that the standards in our society are set by men. Those are the expectations that I'm meant to fulfill. And so looking through a man's eyes, I began to internalize the thought that I was obnoxious for expressing myself. Even when people respected me after the discussion, I felt terrible. And I came to a point where I was transitioning out of middle school. I had a golden opportunity to redefine my persona. I could leave the persona that argues with the homophobic boys or challenges my sexist Bible teacher behind. I, even if I was rewarded for that, for challenging my Bible teacher in a respectful way, because it was discussion, that's not how I felt. I felt like going into high school, politics would no longer be my thing. Because I wanted admiration, I wanted friends, I wanted love here. And who was gonna admire and love an obnoxious person? I realized now that was a mistake, that I shouldn't leave those things, the things that I love so much for the people that I already have established trust with. I need to do this more. I need to get out there and give my opinions. But not all women realize that. The women in my community have internalized these values as well over the years. A woman in my family, a high achieving one, an inspiration to me, a feminist, was talking to me and my cousin, who is currently a PhD student at Georgia Tech. And when I expressed my desire to get a PhD after college, she said, when are you going to have time to get a PhD? You have to get married. We take these messages, when are you going to pursue your academic career if you're busy having children? When are you going to be loved by a man if you're always debating him? And we internalize them. They're around us everywhere. Everything is gendered. My community and family friends are mainly wealthy South Asian immigrants who truly embody the American dream. They come from a country deeply entrenched in misogyny and sexism, yet they advertise their own relative progressiveness. My daughter is valued. She is just as successful as my son. But any South Asian woman you talk to knows that this is not true. The daughter is never treated the same as the son because the daughter is too innocent and meek to watch Silicon Valley. The daughter, if she talks just as loud as the son does at the dinner table, won't get married. And the daughter doesn't have time to do a PhD because she's too busy having babies. My parents' friends are not 
sexist, misogynists who are fond of upholding the patriarchy and are loud about it. They heard these things in their formative years, just as I am hearing them now, and they've effectively stopped themselves from doing anything about it because they have convinced themselves that there's nothing wrong and nothing to fix. The women reflect these values onto their own daughters, and the cycle continues. So I'm trying to break the cycle with myself. It's a cycle all women need to break. And I tell myself one thing. I remember a quote Margaret Atwood, an amazing author, wrote about the male gaze once, and she said, I am a woman with a man inside of her looking at a woman. I am my own voyeur. And I tell myself, I am not a voyeur. I am a woman. I am my own person. Breaking the chain is reminding myself of that, reminding myself that when I'm doubting myself, when I'm feeling obnoxious, that I am worthy of love. I am not obnoxious, and if people think I am, that is their own internalized misogyny, that they've been taught a woman should be quiet, meek, gentle. So I'm working on it. I am worthy of love. I am valued. I am not defined by whether a man will date me or not. Because men don't define me. I define me, and misogyny no longer owns me.